It's never not oh, vague. Look at that clarity <laughs> and awesomeness. Okay. Well, guys, as usual, as usual, as usual, Roman is late. I'm with Daniel. Chalk, my good buddy. As the caption said, we're talking credit score. We're talking credit repair, home loans, business loans. As usual, I got my setup with Instagram Live, Facebook Live, 20 different uh, oh, cameras. <laughs> Dan Daniel is totally uh, confused. Uh, but let's, let's uh, get to it. Um, first off, let me talk about one of our clients, Daniel. So when we talk about credit repair first, you usually like to, to outsource to some uh, experts. Um, what's some things that people can do right off the bat and that's not Daniel's forte he has some experts that he usually works with and well, let's call one of the clients we're working with Joe okay. uh, right now and say Joe's got a 600 uh, what up Sonny and he wants a certain amount okay you know what this is my show scratch all of that let's talk rent versus buy first what up uh, Kelly because uh, that's the main thing people you know have the debate they argue with me about uh, why wouldn't I just rent? Why the heck would I um, buy? And, you know, my dad and your dad will always talk about equity. It's all about the, the equity, course, son. Yeah. Oh, I hope we're not uh, blocking the Instagram here. Okay, cool. Now they can see us. Uh, um, uh, equity. What are some of the other things? You have this, this chart here you want to pop up. Let's see if we can actually... Uh, I don't think we'll be able to, to see this, but why don't you read it uh, to us uh, anyways? And what this chart shows is, you know, your mortgage amount and the interest rates and what exact house you can afford. Or afford yeah. So right now, rates are somewhere between about 4 and 4.5% four and depending on uh, where your credit score falls. Um, so with that said, if you're paying somewhere, I'd say between $3,000 and $3,500 a month in rent, you can probably afford somewhere between a six fifty dollars and $700,000 mortgage. Um, obviously, credit and things like that are going to dictate the interest rate and kind of where exactly you're going to fall between that barrier. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, jumping back into credit real quick, as you okay. mentioned before. So, I like that. some of the quick things you can kind of do to keep scores up is mm -hmm. keep a low balance on your credit cards. Uh, a lot of people believe paying your cards down to zero is key, but it's actually not. Um, I've seen multiple times where I have to have clients go put $10 on their credit card mm -hmm. and actually it, it will boost the score by having that balance. Right, right, So, right. so don't always pay at zero. I, I'm just to stop you on that. Yeah. yeah, so if it's paid down to zero, mm -hmm. cool. But uh, number one, don't close it. I think a lot of people don't know that that actually yeah, negatively down. affects your card. Okay, I pay this thing off. Yeah. Let me call them up and let me just close this thing. That, and, and my only source of knowledge is Ramit Sethi, I, I will teach you to be rich, horrible name, but I thought that was cool. The, what was the, the next thing? What, I think what Daniel's trying to say is don't close that card, keep that card, even if you're not going to use it, but whatever your thing is, whatever fixed costs you have, like Netflix or whatever, uh, that's $10 a month, uh, put it on that card and put it away and let me know if you disagree. And at least that way, it's $10, it's being paid off. It's $10, it's being paid off. Yeah. But if you're completely not using it, then what's the, the purpose uh, of it, right? Would you agree, kind of? Yeah, so, so believe it or not, um, credit companies like when you have a zero balance. Um, I mean, they want you to pay your credit back, but they actually like you having a, a small balance better than nothing. Got it. So keeping a $10 balance on that card will actually boost your score by about 10 more points or so than if you had a zero balance. Right. Um, now, when it comes into like, you know, lates and um, uh, higher balances drawn on credit cards or uh, being over limit or things like that is, um, or disputes on your cards as a whole, uh, that's when we get a credit expert, you know, to jump in and handle those things. But quick, quick fixes like boosting scores and things like that, you know, I can usually help you most of the time and kind of guide you in which cards to pay off and which ones not to and what balances to go to and things like that. Yep. So you said, you're close. You yeah. Said that, so you said that to me that for our other client, yeah. it might be a matter according to the credit per guy of him just opening up another card. Yes. Uh, what what, do you, what did you what you mean uh, by that? Just to make sure, and that's what brings me into credit 
Uh, hey, my, hey, my Amy. Uh, does that? What made you say that for him? Every kid is situational, so that's yeah. different. But were you talking about credit utilization ratio? Was that why? And I'll tell you guys what that. Yeah, so that that's part of it. So on my end, I can only see with what cards are open of what I can do to boost the score. Uh, I don't have the ability to say, if you open a new card and spend this amount, mm -hmm. this is what your score will do, like a credit expert can. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it is just a matter of, of having more credit available to you and and you know smaller balance across the spread of the credit that right. is available. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, sometimes opening a card does help, but um, again, that's you know why I suggested the credit expert to take a look at it because um, that might be a quick fix for a couple points. Right. Right. And um, utilization ratio, yeah, co coach writer on there too. Um, just in in layman's terms, Daniel, Daniel, super smart guy, smart guy, but I want to keep it simple at all times uh, it's basically let's say you have it paid off in zero uh, but your credit limit is five thousand so credit utilization ratio would be the space between zero and five thousand obviously if that space was from zero to twenty five thousand because you have twenty five thousand dollar limit that kind of increases your score and as your balance increases that um, you know limits that space so uh, one other thing when non card companies will let you do, but if you can and you paid your card off to zero, um, you know, calling them up, uh, in, in my opinion, and saying, uh, you know, I've been a good card member, um, my limits have 5000 I got a wedding coming up, I got some expenses coming up, I would like uh, 25000 And a lot of times uh, they'll do that over the phone. Some have caught, uh, uh, caught up to that and they won't allow that over the phone. I think, I feel like Capital most One is them, the yeah. only one, but most of them do and reward you in that. And uh, if you're thinking in that right sense as you get it, you'll realize that, okay, um, I just strengthened my utilization ratio. Um, and why not? And again, th very be very careful. This is assuming that you paid it off and you have a zero balance. Because if you call them up and say that, and you got a balance of like three thousand five hundred dollars and a five thousand dollar card, they might just increase your APR and stuff. So, so uh, you know, take that specifically. I want to uh, touch on, on one thing. Please, way you mentioned uh, that as well. So. A lot of people, like um, like me even personally, I have a small $300 credit card that I use um, as my you know weekly spending limit, and I keep myself to that amount. Now, um, when you look at credit cards as a whole, so if you have a $300 credit card and it's maxed out, they're going to effectively you know ding your credit just as much as if you had a $15,000 card and it was maxed out. So it doesn't necessarily matter True. on... You know, obviously, the, that, that's the size a, it's the space the between yeah, the balance, balance and the limit. That's yeah. the utilization ratio. So if you have a ten thousand dollar credit card and you owe five thousand, it's the same as having a three hundred dollar credit card and owing one fifty. Right. Uh, it does affect the score about the same because you would be at fifty percent on each, right? Mm. Uh, unfortunately, the bigger cards are harder to pay off than the smaller ones. Um, mm. What about balance transfer? A lot of people, again, don't close it. I mean, if you got a balance, then you got to pay it off, first of all, right? You can't close that. But when you're at zero, do not close it. We covered that for those that are just joining us. What up, Manny? Uh, but what do you think about balance transfers? I'm sure everyone can Google this and they understand that that can negatively affect you, right? It's not, it's not a way out. Yeah, because you are essentially closing one credit line and opening another. Um, you know, I haven't had a lot of experience with balance transfers personally. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, you would be basically closing one account and opening another so I could see it. So it essentially means the same thing, yeah, because you're yeah. closing uh, it out. And of course that other bank wants you to come on over uh, to them, yes. right? Better uh, APRs and stuff like that, yeah. But, uh, so, so Daniel, um, everybody I talked to at Keller Williams Los Gatos started saying to me, uh, go to Daniel, have you talked to Daniel? Uh, Daniel's a sharp kid, why not Daniel? So I can't I can critique Daniel all I want, but I can't lie at that. So that's what led me uh, to him. But the other thing that I wanted to pick his head about is, you know, some people that I work with specifically do home loans, but uh, Daniel also focuses on uh, commercial loans, works with, with a lot of hotel clients and, and so forth. And I think the biggest thing is to have confidence uh, in whatever you're doing. And everyone's fearful about businesses, but the only way you can fight that is to take massive action. And I think, you know, confidence only comes from 
preparation, right? And getting this type of information to make sure that it's a, everything's a risk, but a calculated risk only makes you, you know, feel better. But one of the topics of some DMs that I got, so we touched a little bit on uh, credit. Let's just thought we, what you probably do the most is just home loans too, right? That's the uh, and and okay, yeah. Let, let's go back to to rent uh, versus buy, buy. So Dan's got this chart up um, that kind of shows us for those who would who would argue um, why rent versus buy, and just in general, in your opinion, what are some pros and cons of both? Obviously. Um, uh, hello to Pranit and to Jane. Um, what are some things aside from what you know our parents always told us? Because yes, equity is great. You can't always. Uh, I, I guess you can't really use banks aren't giving out uh, credit lines based on equity as much. Is that true? I've they are felt that they are. They are. Yeah. Okay. Because I know people who said they've started their very first business. You know, you know not the smartest thing, but basically. Uh, putting a lien on their home using the equity in their home. So you got to be careful when you do it. Like you can't. I mean, but some don't have options. Business for the very first do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So banks want to see um, ability to repay. So if you just opened the business and you're trying to max out, you know, you loan the value on your house, they're not going to do it because mm. uh, there's no surety that you will repay with the new business. All right. Um, so now going into like the rent versus buy. So I always look at there's basically two benefits to owning, right? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, three. So one would be the property growth. So that would be the equity, right? If you're in the bay. If you're in the bay, yeah. So we're growing about 5% a year. So if you think about it, an average home price is, seven, let's call it 700000 which is probably yeah. conservative. That's right. literally $35,000 a year mm -hmm. in growth. Right? It's, a, it's a good question, Bernie. I don't mean to cut you off. We're going to get to that, I promise. Bernie says, I generally want your opinion on renting versus investing. Uh, kind of similar. I think by investing, she means buying. So back to the three, I apologize. Yeah, yeah so, so the property growth is one. Um, of course, it's not guaranteed. But uh, if you look at year-over-year -year average in our area, that's typically what it is. Um, now, the second benefit is you do get some tax benefits for you know property, um, the interest on your mortgage, property taxes, things like that. That's a big one people um, miss. Big, right? So like, yes, your mortgage payment is higher than, than whatever your rent would be, mm. but after the deductions. savings and the deductions, yeah, yeah, they usually tend to not always break out to the same, but you can get yourself pretty close. Okay. So let's call it just as an example, a $4,000 mortgage payment. Mm usually nets out to the same about a three thousand uh, dollar a month in rent right so um, I'm, flip, I'm flipping Daniel's phone over he's had about four clients call him since we've been talking <laughs> and I don't want him to use this as a, as a way to kind of short but keep going okay so that's one uh, and then the last the last piece actually is the the best piece right so like if you pay three thousand dollars a month in rent mm -hmm. you are never gonna see any of that money back true where in mortgage you're actually paying a percentage of your payment to pay off the home. Yep. So I guess what, yeah. Pranit, your landlord is taking your rent and, and paying off and paying property. off the mortgage on the property. Yes. Uh, and, and I just realized he pretty much just answered your questions, uh, Pranit. And my question is, why not that be you, right? You're putting your heart and money towards that. When that place is completely paid off, you might move on to the next one, Pranit. But at least then you can rent that out, right? And and have um, somebody else. Uh, hop in, right? Well aware, she says. Uh, and uh, th I mean, that's essentially it. But people get caught up in that. Oh, but there's risks. If I buy the house, I have this, then and, and, and then that's fine. You can play it safe in that way. But uh, essentially, well, if you have no chance renting, right? Yeah, you're you have no and your rents and your rents can go up with your landlord, right? That's right. Um, and they can, yeah, but, but, but when you're working with the, the bank, things are a little more negotiable. The banks have to adhere to certain regulations. Um, and, you know, now we're hearing a lot more about affordable housing, and that's kind of the pressure they're putting on uh, landlords. But, um, yeah, I mean, watch, watch Millionaire Shack. Yeah. There's on two YouTube other pretty. things to touch on, too. So down payment obviously plays a factor into this. Okay. Uh, saving up the down payment is always tough. Uh, in our county, there actually are some special programs. Uh, they are income-based programs, but you can get into a house with no money down. Uh, basically, you're, you're doing a second loan for the down payment, and it just you never make a payment on the second loan. It just occurs interest over time until you sell the house. I know that. I agree. Um, but uh, you can also, you know, there's a 3% down program, a 35 a 5% down program. 
Uh, all of those programs allow for gift funds. Mm, okay. Yep. So, I mean, if you have family, friends, anyone that's willing to contribute, you mm -hmm. can use that money towards your down payment. And what's and what's a gift fund, Daniel? What can they do at the at the end of close of escrow, right? Yeah. So so a gift fund is um, basically family gifting you the money for down payment. Uh, that money does go towards the home and it will be basically sitting in, in there as equity. So if you put, let's say you bought a $500,000 house, you put down 5%, your loan's 475, the house is worth 500. So you instantly have equity and, and banks make that a mandatory thing to get in because mm -hmm. they don't want to lend 100% of the value. Yep. Now, now again, there are some programs that you can do that, mm -hmm. um, but again, it's and, the, and these all are kind of, are dictated by your FICO score aside from other things, right? Uh, income, FICO score, down payment, things like that, yeah. Got it, got it. And the other thing in certain programs, correct me if I'm wrong, and for you, Praneet, if the only thing standing in your way is that down payment is the gift fund is, say, you can have your mom, your friend, whoever, gift you the money, and then at the close of escrow, they would essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you'll be able to, or not be able to... Send that back? Is that correct? No, that so, programs? no, in that program you wouldn't because okay. you'd actually use the money towards down payment. Got it, and that would be kept, okay. Exactly, yeah. Got it, got it. I think what, what you're touching on is there are some programs that allow for gift funds for reserves. Mm. So as you start buying... Oh, for reserves. Yeah, as you start buying bigger houses, they want to see payment reserves as well, not only down payment. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, for layman's term, can, uh, to keep it simple, see what people who don't know what are reserves, just... A minimum amount they want you to keep in. Yeah, so if you take a loan over $636,000 in our county, banks want to see that you have the ability to make the, the mortgage payment for six months, nine months, or 12 months, mm -hmm. depending on how far over that 636 you are. Got it. And those are essentially reserves, right? That's right. So let's say uh, Praneet says, okay, I'm in. I'm in. Daniel, walk me through uh the the process and you pro you do this all day and for those who don't know again it's not about me and you it's about giving value to people yep. typically you know probably the pain in the butt is that little checklist and then on top of the little checklist you're saying hey just get that in we can start uh what i want to do is like have you know one banker that just permanently keeps that checklist even though it's updated so then when things come about you can just call them up and they can uh, execute it and i'm gonna have my, our family cpa on soon that's gonna be nuts because taxes are uh, are crazy. What is the typical, and everybody knows that typical, we want your W-2s, we want this, we want that, but I want to go in and I want to be annoying and break down, okay, but why are, your, why are your W-2s? What's happening in there? Because if we understand that instead of just handing over the checklist to Daniel, it kind of gives us a better understanding of the bigger picture, which kind of makes us make better decisions in the future, right? That's what I kind of yeah. sent to you on the notepad uh, last night, which I felt uh, is important, which when people rewatch this on YouTube, they'll be like, okay, he's being boring and annoying, but later on, they're going to be like, wow, that was really good information because everyone just skips over it and they, they think that, well, I know that, right? Like Praneet said, I'm well uh, uh, aware, but... The problem is when it comes to money and these type of things, it's kind of an emo emotional tie, right? And people are kind of like uh, afraid that it's a stupid question or that they don't know something. But that, that's I, 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 I think, yeah, that's what they're here for. And there's no egos in this. If, you, you know, if you're going to ask one question, chances are there's 10 to 15 people, right? As our teacher would say in the classroom, that have that same exact yep. uh, question. So checklist, uh, somebody wants to purchase that home, what do you need from them, Daniel? So, so think of two of everything, okay? So um, two years of taxes, two years of W-2s, last two pay stubs, last two bank statements. Those are, I would say, the good starting point because we can see income, uh, we can see how much money for down payment. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I didn't add was running a credit report, um, mm -hmm. and then that would show the credit and you know any monthly uh, obligations that you may have, so car loans, uh, credit cards, things like that. You're, that you're, enti your you're, ent mortgage. you're entitled to one free one a year by law, right? Yes. Let's just always assume that people know nothing, but aside from that, they can go 
What was it? Credit Sense? Other yeah, a lot of banks of offer, you know, free credit reports like Wells okay. Fargo. I've seen that, Bank yeah. Bank of America. Um, They're doing stuff with FICO. You can go on freecreditreport.com. Okay. That is where you get the one free credit report a year. Mm. Um, and that will actually show you scores in a full report. Most places only show you, you know, what you owe. Right. They don't actually give you the scores. I don't, my FICO's not doing it anymore, Fair Isaac Corporation, but it's like 15 bucks a month. And I make my parents go on it. But apparently, if you want to sign up today, you can't do it anymore. But if you, if you did it before, you still continue to have it. And what they had was kind of a, a real-time uh, report. They wouldn't go with uh, TransUnion and Equifax, but... Uh, no, no, they would be with Equifax, but not Experian and TransUnion. But the thing is, they would literally like real time during the day. And I, I thought it was important for uh, my parents because if anyone, you know, you're worried about identity theft, you're worried about that type of stuff, this is like real time alerts that if anything changes at any time, uh, which I thought was uh, very, very valuable. But uh, I, I know we keep getting off the home loan process, but I feel like this is so important. So if we have to give the one on one for, for dummies, uh, it would be, so there's typically three bureaus, but Daniel, you can come up on that, but the different banks, ch you know, use different ways, I Everyone guess. Everyone uses the same three bureaus. Um, TransUnion. Mortgage, yeah, TransUnion. Equifax. Equifax and Experian. Experian. Yeah, now a lot of uh, mortgage banks like myself, we, we use a third party uh, company that pulls these reports. Mm -hmm. Um, you, most of the time mortgage banks use a lot of the same companies uh, to get access to the reports. Now, when you start looking at like bigger banks like Wells Fargo and Chase and these guys, they, they have a different way of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I've never actually worked for a big bank, so I don't know exactly their process, but mm -hmm. um, I mean, I could pull they every just, 40 minutes essentially. They're still obligated to those three, but they just, I don't know what the word is, they pull on different factors. Like if you're Bank of the West, one of, one of our clients is using Bank yeah. of the West, they're going to essentially, I guess, examine. Uh, <laughs> Pernita, Pernita, I still love you, don't worry. She's like, I'm well aware of the landlord's advantage, everything else, grateful for your involvement, and uh, gentlemen, awesome, awesome, awesome. I was just, I was, I'm sorry I was using you as an example, Pernita. Uh, uh, you're uber, uber intelligent, but what I meant was in general, this is kind of an emotionally tied subject. So when people know they have issues going on, we like to kind of wipe it under the rug until it comes back to haunt us. I say this because I've been there, right? I'm not perfect. Uh, either, but that's what I meant for it. Is there, there's anytime there's anything going on in your life, or there's some issue, the, the solution, in my opinion, will always be to take massive action towards that subject. Right? The the best thing you could do is the right thing. The worst thing you could do is absolutely nothing. Right? What up, Spencer? Uh, I got a mirror from the Netherlands. He's got a subway in the Netherlands uh, train station. Great guy. He was at training with me. Uh, but you want to touch on another thing? Oh yeah. So last thing. Um in our in the mortgage industry so I think um, execution as far as executing the loan is the biggest thing uh, a lot of clients you know as they're going into writing offers on homes the sellers are being told by you know their agents and just word around that you know we need to close quick we need to have contingencies removed quickly they, they want surety in your offer uh, unfortunately for clients this is pretty much all out of their hands, right? Things don't go perfect, uh, yeah. It, it's really in the bank's hands. So, like, right. uh, a lot of people don't really get the opportunity to build the relationship, like, with their their mortgage advisor right. when they're out shopping because they're in such a rush, right? right? So, like, picking the right person, I, I think, is um, very, very hard to do. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I was thinking about this last night, and I was like, it, it's so ingenious, like, when, when you go out and, and meet a client, like, mm -hmm. you really, really build a relationship. You're out looking at homes and, and doing different things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you actually have the relationship more than, than say, someone like me. True, would. true. So, as someone going out and buying, like, I would really put your trust in your real estate agent to guide you to the right lenders. Because they do this on a... On a uh, more constant basis, right, right? right? And so, like, a lot of times when I see transactions in our industry go sideways is when the client says, well, I have my Bank of the West guy, or I have my Wells Fargo person, or I have my uh, mom's friend that's in Arizona, or whatever. I used right? to think that way, too. So, yeah. transactional relationship versus long-term relationship. I think that's universal towards, I had to get my parents to stop doing that and say, let's choose one CPA, let's choose 
you know, right. one, of course, you should always get bids, always get second opinions, but the the value of that long-term relationship, I think over the short transactional, right, not waiting until mm -hmm. you now, oh, we'll figure it out, we're trying to launch that business, but then we'll just with five different people, which brings me to a fact, working uh, with somebody uh, like you, one of the benefits is another bank can only go within their bank and there's like levels of bureaucracy above them and they can only do so much when... Um, I was working with a client and, you know, essentially came back to me and they have an entire network um, of banks. And, and is it okay for you to say that, obviously, right? So you would have, yeah. what's the difference between the main bank and then broker? Yeah, so like so we're a mortgage banker, meaning we fund, we fund like 90% of the loans that we write. So all, the whole process happens here on site at this office in Campbell, okay. um, which makes execution very easily uh, done for a new buyer. Got it. Uh, now there's also brokered banks where we basically send the loan off to a different bank and they, they do all the uh, underwriting and draw, doc drawing and funding and it's really out of our hands. Mm -hmm. uh, you lose a lot of control of the transaction and can really, you're just a number in a, in a pool pretty much at that, that point. Right. So I, we do both. Um, the reason we do both is because we don't always have the products in house that, that brokers have. Got it. So we want to be able to service the client for whatever the program is that they might need and have, have something that fits their needs and you know financial situation. Got it, got it. What up, Spencer? Yeah, uh, my cousin from the UK on two, and Spencer played soccer at uh, at SF State. Okay, so Spencer wants to buy a home. He's uh, he's at he's. He's been renting, giving away his hard-earned money to make some other landlord rich so he, he can pay off that building that he's staying in. Um, uh, so we talked about the, you said two of everything, the checklist, we want W-2s, we want... So I have a, a quick, easy system that I can send out to you or any client that I have. They can log in, mm -hmm. make a password, uh, secured site. Mm -hmm. All the documents that we need are in there. Uh, as you start uploading stuff, I actually get notified on my end, so my okay. team can start pulling it, putting your file together. Got it. Uh, I usually like to try and meet clients in person because uh, you know buying a house is a big thing, and uh, by phone or phone communicating, there's always it's mm -hmm. it's not as strong as being in person and seeing the numbers and really understanding the process. Right. Uh, if someone's not local, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to make someone drive and, here. And, and this, this, sound, right? this sounds silly, but can you stress the importance of how important it is uh, to be honest on every single thing? Like, let's be, let's keep it real. Like, because uh, that's what I have to tell my clients that in negotiation too, we're all in that. I used to be there, that that paranoid mo uh, mode when it comes to sharing information. Uh, well, why do you need that? Uh, how, how do you need that? Well, let's not. No, we can't show him uh, that. But what I tried to say is put your trust in that person, share all your information right. completely because the more information he has, the, the better he can make decisions on, okay, how do we find a way uh, to find the solution for Joe or Jill? This is the outcome they're looking for. Yep. The routes may change, but the outcome should stay the same. So the, may, the more that we're transparent, we give all information. It sounds like a, a silly uh, question, but I feel that's yeah, important because I'm trying to think like, like them so yeah. I'm so I'm actually I'm on your team right, right. so um, anything that I don't know is just gonna create issues down the road when the underwriters do figure it out uh, and they will figure it out every time I should say. Um, so my goal is to structure the loan or, or put you in a, a, a bank that will allow whatever the issue might have been or maybe there is no issue and you exactly. can go anywhere and we go get you the best interest rate. Right? And it might not even be an issue, like you said. It's smaller than you think in, in your mind, right? Yeah. So yeah. be open, be transparent about it, and yeah. uh, that way early on he can save uh, us all time and find like a, yeah. a solution uh, for it. Um, why, why W-2s, savings, checkings, accounts, mm -hmm. uh, what taxes, else? Pay taxes, stubs. pay stubs. Yeah. And, and, and he mentioned, I want to be that annoying technical guy, that he his goal is you guys don't have to always know all. If we, we told you all the crazy play by plays of how hard we're working for you behind the scenes, sometimes it'll drive you crazy, make your head spin. Our job is to make it very easy and flawless. But I think for the terms of this, it's important to know why W2 and be really technical and annoying to you because you can understand how this affects you in a big picture way. So, uh, W2s, you're looking at how much money they're bringing in by 
bi-weekly because this is judging the ability to repay, repay the loan. Right. right. So, so they W2s, don't know that. They don't. W2s come from your employer so and then your taxes you file. So we want to line those two up to make sure the income that's on the taxes and what your employer stated that you made right. line up to be the same. I see, that's crazy. So, so that's how those two work. Um, also, during the process, we go to the IRS and actually uh, confirm that what the employer filed on mm. W-2s yep. or the employer and, and you filed on taxes all line up with what you provided. Right. Um, so that, that's one of it. And then your pay stubs is your current pay. So what you made two years ago, you might not be making now. Mm. So that's why we get current pay stubs. Got it. Got it. I, I got this other video running that I'm going to throw up on YouTube, and then there'll be ticker symbols on how to get a hold of Daniel in case you guys don't you do not want to go through me, want to just talk to him directly. You guys are more than welcome, and I recommend it because if I didn't think he was uh, legit or smart, he wouldn't be sitting next to me right now, right? Uh, but this guy knows uh, his stuff. So, um, so yeah. So you have you have some rates here that people can check out. That's kind of more rent versus buy. We covered those three things. Let's go real quick into. Uh, commercial. I saw quite a few commercial guys who have trucking lines, have hotels that popped in uh, for a second. Uh, how does the world change, in your opinion, when we're going into... So now we got completely different loan products. we got completely different regulations. We went, just went into the, re the regulated residential world to the wild, wild west. Uh, what kind of value can we give these guys for anybody thinking about starting a, a business or um, loans in the business world? Yeah. So we don't, I, I wouldn't say per se do like, uh, well, we do loans for business purpose loans, but they're not, um, they're, they're always tied to a property. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a lot of times when you have investment properties that aren't, um, you know, occupied by you, uh, you can take out a business purpose loan on those properties for rehabbing or buying additional properties or whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's this whole thing in our industry called TRID, which is uh, a set of regulations that we have to follow if the home is owner occupied. Um, so to avoid that, uh, we do have like, there's different funds that manage money and what they'll do is lend you out uh, essentially cash without income verification or credit or things like that. They loan more on uh, how, you know, the size of the loan to what mm -hmm. the value of the property is. Right. What if Dominic? Dominic yes. Yeah. So um, a lot of people kind of do that to like jumpstart projects. So if you own a piece of flat land and you can't quite get a construction loan yet because you don't have the entitlements done with the city, mm -hmm. you can actually take these short term high interest rate loans to gather the funds to do the entitlements. Mm -hmm. And then you would refinance out of that to get into say like a, a normal construction loan. Interesting. It, uh, and, yeah. and and would they work with the same bank when they did that? I have a buddy in Monterey, and he's finished the hotel with the construction loan, yeah. but he can't get out of that. He knows who he is. Uh, he can't get out of that because they want certain things, so he, he has to end up probably, I guess, putting a bond because the construction yeah. guys won't release him on that loan. I say this because it's realistic examples, yeah. right? Everybody's on different levels. There's some of these people haven't even started businesses, mm -hmm. but... Then, then they were assuming they would refinance that other loan, yeah. right? But some of those things happen. Sometimes. So it all depends on, on how much he owes and how much the property is worth. Got it. So usually those banks want to stay somewhere around 60 to 70% of the value. So if a property is worth $10 million, usually you can't really have more than about $7 million on the, you know, worth of loans on that property. Okay. So if he does need a short-term uh, business purpose loan to get out of whatever the situation is, He's in to get out of the construction loan. Uh, it sounds like well, some of the construction wasn't completed, but the money was used, and maybe they're over budget or what have you. The most likely, yes. That, this that's is a brand new franchise of a, yeah. of, a, of a hotel um, yeah. of theirs. So, yeah, i got to put them in touch with you, uh, too. That's one thing. Um, yeah. Now, another well. thing for people buying and flipping properties as well, too, mm -hmm. uh, you see a lot of these cash offers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're technically not cash. Um, they okay. are private investors, you know, putting, loaning you money on high interest rate. But you can write your offers as a seven or ten day close, mm -hmm. just like a cash offer would be. Uh, so a lot right, back up one more time. My brain's a little slow. Okay. <laughs> so say one more time. So so hard money loans is, mm -hmm. is what essentially a business purpose loan is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's uh, imagine someone manages a fund of say. 
fifty million dollars. Okay. You go to this fund and say I need X amount of money and it will be tied to this property I'm purchasing. Got that it. will be my collateral. Got right? it. Got it. Got it. They'll lend you that money at a high rate, mm. eight, nine, ten percent. Okay. Okay. But you can have that money within seven to ten days. Got it. So if you're buying a house for say a million dollars and you want to buy and flip that property. Mm -hmm. They'll give you the seven hundred thousand to buy that home, seventy percent cash. Cash, yep. and then you would put down the difference. Got so it. you can close on that property as a cash buyer. Mm -hmm. So it, what, is there a name for that? Is there a specific type of loan? It's a hard money loan. A hard money loan. Yeah. Okay. For those wondering, got it. Got it. Is that is that kind of what we're seeing overseas a lot with the? No, I. That's actual real real. That's real actual cash. real cash. <laughs> okay. Um, Hard money loans more for like uh, people, like I said, buying and flipping property that don't want to uh, leverage a lot of their assets, but they want to buy multiple properties at a time. Okay. Uh, so it, it's nice, right? Because if you can buy a million dollar home and only put in, put in 300000 plus construction, mm -hmm. and you can do that on multiple homes, mm -hmm. right? So if you are capped at, say, a million dollars to buy and flip, mm -hmm. you can buy three homes using hard money versus mm -hmm. that one home at a million dollars. Because that would eat up all your cash flow. Right? All right, so you've, you've done everything right. Uh, yeah. you, you've done everything by the book. You're, you're 29 like me. You're going in. Typica typically, what is the least percentage uh, in a best case scenario that you should be putting down as a down payment towards uh, the home just so people know and they're getting treated your fairly? Your typical residential property? 3%? 3%. 3%. 3%. Okay. Is there any California regulation tied to that? Is that the minimum? That's the, oh, that's the minimum unless you do one of those uh, FHA uh, down payment assistant programs where Got it. you don't put anything in. Got it. Usually when we're making an offer on our home, the minimum usually be 3% yeah. depending on the person's situation. So uh, I'm sure there's a reason why they don't allow you to go lower than that, right? They don't they want banks to have a starting point yes. and not, or, or is it based on market rate? No, you can choose 3%. So the reason that they require you to put some money down, so teeth in the game again, yeah, skin in the game, right? So the bigger home you buy, the the bigger the requirement is. Yeah. So what they're adjusting for is market depreciation, right? So like, um, like again, six thirty six is our county limit. Mm -hmm. Every county is a little different. Mm -hmm. Below that, you could do three, three and a half percent. Above that, you got to do ten percent minimum. Got it. Uh, there are some programs you can do five, but then the terms start getting you know, a little unfavorable. Mm -hmm. But there are options. Um, so it, all it is really is the banks just want you to have some skin in the game, and they don't want to be, uh, you know, financing hundred percent of properties because only they can lose at that point. Got it. So um, right now we are at an all time low for you know, defaults and things like that. So banks are getting a little bit more aggressive. Interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, you gotta have some skin in the game. Right, right. Uh, but I want to see what other um, questions I had for you guys. Um, that uh, oh, awesome. We have our, we have so many people texting and uh, emailing right now. What up, wife is on uh, uh, as well. Um, but you know, we touched on commercial loans. Obviously, the biggest thing of commercial loans is pretty much uh, collateral, right? Uh, or, I mean, what if you have your house? You have your, uh, you know, biweekly job. Whether you're making two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand uh, dollars a year, is it still tough for you to get a uh, business loan? I mean, the only real thing aside from collateral would be like how much do you have in savings, right? I mean, yeah, they want to see some reserves, and obviously, it's all about the down payment. For the business loans, yeah. So, what about net worth? Like, what if I have a certain amount of businesses and, you know, they're pretty profitable. Some might be breaking even, uh, but obviously each one has its assessed uh, net worth when we talk about assets, right? Mm -hmm. um, would that would be considered things of collateral, really, right? Is that how it benefits uh, people people think, okay, well, why does he keep opening up uh, businesses? Uh, they may be profitable, may, may not be profitable. Why does that benefit him? It was so, supposed to be net worth. So are you discussing like a, 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 a business, business purpose yes, loan? Yes, business purpose. Okay, so so those banks, they're, they're hard money lenders and that's what we use. Mm -hmm. um, they don't, they care that you have some ability to repay, but like at the end of the day, let's say you put down 30% mm -hmm. on a million dollar property. Right. If you default, Mm -hmm. They 
they don't care because as long as they you have your equity. Yes, yes right? as long as you and you, as long as you have collateral. Exactly. That's what. Well, they care. the collateral is the property. Okay. So if if they're giving you seventy percent of the value of the property you're buying, yeah, you're putting in thirty percent. Got it. Hello, so Carol. if if you don't repay, mm -hmm. they've just got gained that thing. 30%. Okay, so your job is very situ yeah, so. situational, my man, uh, but I like recognizing trends, mm -hmm. and when you see things that are, uh, you know, the, every, you've seen it all, but then all of a sudden you say, man, this is probably the one thing I see the most common, mm -hmm. that there's so many different aspects, so it's very situational, but 100%, I always see this, this and that. I love those because that is something of value to them that they cannot be that person. So my question I've written down is, what were some tips you would give to that someone, to that person uh, that you see the most often? Mm -hmm. Not enough funds in the savings account. <laughs> no. Well, that that's one. I, I think uh, what I see the most often is is uh, clients two weeks in contract and they're at a big bank and now the big bank comes back and says they can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's two sides to mortgages, right? There's a banker who's got a very very small box, a lot of money down reserves. Uh, low debt to income, meaning that they won't use as much of your income to qualify you for a mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people try and force themselves in the big bank's box when they're not in the big bank's box. Mm -hmm. So someone like me who has a lot more options um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can find a program for them or, or help clients get from, say, 700 to 750 or, or things like that. Mm -hmm. So what I see most, again, is they, clients start at big banks, Big banks come back in a contract, they can't do it, and then they come to someone like me that has a program for them. Got it, got it. So, and and I, what do you think they do that? Essentially, I think it's the biggest thing, another thing, and Ram says, is we see Bank of America, we physically see Bank of America, we physically see Wells Fargo, so yeah. we assume that we have no other options, but guess what? There's just hundreds of options for you and because of that reason people opt to them when uh check the track record check the history guess who's uh guess who's going to jail most of the time it's wells fargo <laughs> again in trouble and bank of america and those are actually some be some time to be your tough options but as soon as the financial crisis happens or something happens people want feel like they want to physically be able to see their bank and then when something happens you see that people line up that they want to pull their money out of the bank which is you know not always um and, and tuck it under their mattress, right? When it's not don't always... Do that. Yeah, don't do that. It. <laughs> it, it, it's always a great idea to keep your money in there. And that's why we see more FDIC, right? We'll see more um, fairly insured up to $25,000. Why, why do people... Uh, why do we see banks doing that more than more? To, is that since 2008 to let people know that, you know, your money just can't just go poof, right? In a situation of, uh, say, this upcoming quote-unquote crash that brings fear. I'm praying for a crash. You know, people can look at it two ways. When things crash, they could think that they're going to lose or they can look at it if they save and do all the right things now. Never, will there, never will there be a better time to buy up and eat up uh, everything, right? When you do look at the biggest... Uh, millionaires and billionaires who've been able to leapfrog uh, during times. It's been times of uncertainty, times of depression. So don't give in to like the media, the hype, the fear. There's always uh, positive aspects to it. You know, you look at the millionaires, even like Trump during those crashes, they bought more golf courses than they ever did uh, before, right? So you can look at it as fear, fear, fear and put my money on my mattress or you can look at it as no, I'm going to keep doing the right things. Times are always going to change. How can I go up, you know? But but back to, I do this all the time on a tangent, but uh, back to FDIC, uh, that's typically just insurance that the bank has thrown out there to say, this is how much we'll cover if we... Yeah, so, so banks want to see you, obviously they're in the business of having you put your money into the bank and loaning it out, and that's, they make interest, and that's how they, they survive, right? So I think just giving people more surety that... Um, they're, they're gathering enough money to come mm -hmm. in that they can guarantee you a certain percentage of it back. Uh, yeah. Makes people feel more comfortable about putting their money in the bank and, and helps what, the bank grow, right? What it, what it means is that money that you're depositing in the bank every single day, yeah. the bank is taking that money that you're depositing and using it to loan out to other people. Yeah. But where they make the, their most money is on, on APR, yeah. on the interest, and on those little fees, which obviously, again, Wells Fargo Bank of America has the most ridiculous ones of and we're going to charge you monthly fees just to keep your money in our accounts which we're taking and we're loaning out to other people, people yeah. which is ridiculous but those little 
ATM fees here and there. So those are small, but you multiply that times the amount of people that are actually with the bank, and it makes them incredible, incredible amounts of money, which immediately made me switch to Charles Schwab for my, my check card, just because they have little things where no matter what ATM you go to at the end of the month, they'll return you back the fees. Um, you know, I suggest you guys don't take anything we say for fact. Always question us, double check, get your second opinions, find a, uh, a middle route, you know, uh, to it. And uh, as I said, like uh, with other people, if there's something you could DM us later and say that, you know, or fact check us or correct us on something, I would never get angry. I would be stoked and happy uh, to share it with everybody uh, else because that's how we learn things, right? Um, and I think that's the uh, the most important thing about this whole thing is go to go to someone, get second opinions, go to somebody like Daniel, who's immediately can send this to several several banks and see what they come back with. If you have other uh, options and stuff, because um, I just believe that there's uh, there's always a way. You want to do things right, never take shortcuts, but you always always have uh, have options. Uh, what do you think, Daniel? Anything else you want to? Touch on. I think. I, I think. I think if they. I think if they rewind it back ten times, that there's still going to be so many awesome bits of, of knowledge and value. Uh, yeah. And I mean, uh, I think we we pretty much summed a lot of it up. Um, plug yourself. You gotta plug yourself. Yeah. Be, Who are you? How do they find you? Okay. So um, my phone number is four zero eight four zero one three seven nine three. Uh, I work for Cal Financial, and that's K-A-L Financial, and uh, we're based out of Campbell. Uh, you can find me pretty much on Zillow or anywhere online. Um, Sweet. I do have a lot of reviews on those sites that are, you know, five stars, so I do tend to pop up when you search my name. Awesome, awesome. And Daniel Chalk. Chalk, yes. Right. Uh, you have da Daniel and Easy last one. name's <laughs> Chalk, yeah. This is Chalk Talk. Chalk Talk, right? there you go. Um, well, awesome. I hope you guys... Uh, enjoyed that. Um, we'll be hanging out with Daniel again, but feel free to DM me, DM him. We'll, we'll put you uh, in touch with him. But I think the main part of this is, you know, there's so much uh, knowledge out there, but we want to do our best to kind of document this. And, uh, you know, I think it's a great thing to give you any type of knowledge, any type of value we can. And if it helps you and it uh, changes things uh, in any way for you, it was uh, totally worth it. So, Hope you guys enjoyed it. Carol, hope you like this. And um, but I believe next week, I can't wait um, to have uh, you know our family uh, CPA uh, on who just, I don't understand. This is going to be the one time I'm not going to talk when he comes on because uh, I, I'm humble enough to say I know nothing about uh, taxes and how we can benefit us. And this man is just a obviously a, a genius. He really changed things for us and our family. So uh, kill your Monday, kill your week. It's Roman. And Daniel, thank you guys uh, so much uh, for watching, and we hope this uh, brings you guys some serious value. Cheers.